Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster, and today we are in part two of our analysis of Gucci Fall Winter 2018. My favorite show of all time. Last week in part one, we talked about all of the cultural critics and philosophers that made this Gucci show possible from a conceptual point of view. We covered the show notes from beginning to end and talked about how Gucci's creative director, Alessandro Michelli, used the works of Foucault and Donna Haraway to construct a new vision of identity through a runway collection. If you haven't seen part one, you should go watch part one first. Before we dive completely into part two, I wanna give you guys a quick update about the channel and what we are doing from a scheduling point of view. This is the season finale episode of our third season. We have grown astronomically over the course of the last 11 episodes, and I am incredibly grateful to all of you guys for watching and supporting, thank you so much. Basically, I do 11 weekly episodes in a row, and then I take a little bit of time off to kind of recoup, catch up on other things in my life, and prepare for an incredible next season. I am certainly going to miss you people a whole lot, and if you feel like you're going to miss me, you can follow me on Instagram, where I post daily mood board inspo from the massive backlog that I have of all these different fashion pictures. Okay, no more self promo, that's it. Let's dive back in. Gucci Fall Winter 2018, part two. As far as high concept art is concerned, this is basically a gold mine. So we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about how the actual clothes themselves carry out the concepts that we talked about from last week. But at the same time, we don't wanna ignore some stuff that is really interesting and kind of crazy, like the collaboration for the heads and the dragons in the show. And we're also gonna spend some time kind of opening up a dialogue about cultural appropriation. If you've gotten this far, I'm going to assume that you watched part one, and I'm also going to assume that you were super awesome and actually watched the original Gucci Show video itself. Uh, but just in case you need a refresher course of some kind, here are all of the looks again. It is, uh, it is an awful lot of looks. 90 looks to be exact. It's a lot of looks. All right, bet, let's get cracking. Gucci, fall winter 2018, part two, let's go. So for this first part, we're going to have to jump around a whole lot. The whole show very much hinges on this clash of references and ideas and themes and patterns and cuts, which I think is mostly trying to reference the part of Donna Haraway's A Cyborg Manifesto, where she talks about creating your own identity through your affinities. So instead of having very crisp, cohesive looks go down the runway, we have a lot of this kind of stuff. A word that got thrown around a whole lot in reviews for this show initially was the word nightmarish, which is an understandable descriptor to be honest. I mean, the whole thing takes place in an operating room where the lights and the coloration are really weird to begin with. Then the show kicks off, first model walks out, and we expect to see a look that involves some kind of accessory that's planned to sell really well, and instead we see the model holding her own head. Later on we see another model holding their own head, we see another model very stoically holding a baby dragon, another model who looks like she's just started to get used to the fact that the third eye sprouted out of her forehead. In a more subtle move, one model had horns growing out of his head. But even beyond the more obvious horror film stuff, there was a lot of stuff that really felt like it came out of a nightmare. Like the sort of thing where you're dreaming and it's terrifying and you wake up in a cold sweat, but then when you think about the thing that was actually chasing you, it was like, that was like a, it was like a weird balaclava man guy, but it was very colorful. I promise it was scary. A number of the models wore translucent dry cleaning bags. We have a pagoda for a hat. We have some nightmarish interpretation of David Bowie looking stuff. Honestly, some of the looks are so layered and they're so busy and the face is so covered that it reminds me a lot of Vanilla Jalaba. And if you don't know, you should pause and look it up. So yeah, lots of elements in the show that are unsettling, a lot of elements that are disturbing. And I think honestly, all this stuff is pretty apt. Haraway talks about this future that she's referring to where we choose our own identities as being one that is kind of scary because there's not a lot that we know about that. Everything that we've built things on have been very much based on these categories that we're able to stick people in. And if we were to totally free those categories up and people could just wander from category to category, we don't really know what that would look like. And for me at least, there's a very undeniable, confusing beauty to a lot of this stuff. 
like I can't identify what about it I feel is so attractive, but I feel very drawn to a lot of these clothes. Sarah Mower's Vogue review for this show had a pretty good quote near the end of it where she talks about the multiculturalism that's woven into the show itself. She writes, the show radiated cross-cultural meanings, a clashing of symbols by a brand that has markets to charm across the globe. There were Russian babushka headscarves and modest, covered up folk costume dresses next to spangled 20s showgirl chain mail and jewelry, a pagoda hat and Chinese pajamas, English tweed, Scottish plaid and a fair isle sweater, Italian 80s vintage beige businesswoman suiting, a glam power woman ruched dress and gold leather peplum jacket. Gucci logos were everywhere, of course, and there were branded love letters to Sega, Major League Baseball, Manga, Paramount and Russ Meyer. Wait, but what do those things even have to do with each other? No time to explain, we gotta keep moving. Fall Winter 2018 introduced the Raja line from Gucci, which in look six we see the medium Raja shoulder bag, which in the product description features a hybrid symbol merging two of the house's most distinct codes, the horsepit and the interlocking G. And speaking of Raja, which is Sanskrit for king, by the way, I'm pretty sure that some of the jewelry from the show was based on the 1922 film, The Young Raja. Also, Raja is a name for a certain type of butterfly, which most certainly inspired this look. Historically, Rajas are often represented by tigers, which is probably why tigers are on most of the bags and also on this certain pin, which is actually a replica pin of a Hattie Carnegie pin from the 1940s. Looks 16, 18, 37, 49, and 82 all feature what's called the basketball bag, which is the English name for what is actually called the tifoso bag, which is Italian for the word fan, like a sports fan. But what's interesting is that that is a masculine noun that's mostly being carried by women. Oh, maybe that has some something to do with the heads thing from early? Maybe, I don't know, let's keep moving. This nightmarish look is based off of a Scandinavian ski mask from the 1960s, but it also might take some inspirations from certain depictions of a New Year's beast from Chinese mythology. There's also pretty frequent use of these hand-painted silk scarves that have been part of the house's history for forever that they're now using to make like jumpsuits and other crazy stuff with. We're not moving too quickly, are we? This entire show is supposed to be an overwhelming tidal wave of references and feelings and all these crazy images. And if you're looking for something cohesive to bring all that together, trust me, you will drive yourself crazy. The two weeks that I spent preparing for this single episode, I had a hundred tabs open every single day on my PC. So why is the show like this? Alessandro, what are you doing? A lot of times art is not presented to us in a very linear way. Sometimes it's just a cloud of ideas and we have to just take it for what it is. And I think that's kind of what we have here, but we have a little bit of explanation from Alessandro Michelli to kind of give this cloud of ideas a little bit of structure. So in a way, we're talking a little bit about the creative process. How most pieces of art have to be kind of sloppy and all over the place and multi-referential before they can become this crystallized final product. To take it back to last week, Foucault has a book actually called The Birth of the Clinic. A little bit of a translation thing there, but generally what he was talking about was teaching hospitals. Part of his many points in that work is that historically people of medicine were also part of the church. They were people who felt that they were responsible for your soul as well as the well-being of your body. And so they would come and visit you and they would console you spiritually, but they would also be the person who is able to give the best medical advice available. Foucault talks about how historically there is this gigantic shift that took place where the person who was at your home and with whom you had a rapport and a relationship with who was consoling you spiritually and giving you advice about your body, that that switches to you lying unconscious on a table naked where a stranger is cutting your abdomen open in front of hundreds of other strangers in stadium seating. That is a mighty shift. Okay, so to bring that back to the show here, fashion designers are put under an enormous amount of pressure. With fashion, the idea of a deadline is a whole different thing. You have just over a month to produce an entire collection, 90 outfits. So this shift that Foucault is talking about where doctors went from having extremely personable relationships with their patients to seeing them only as a diseased kidney that must be fixed. I'm sure there's a little bit of similar feelings where Alessandro Michele went from feeling like this is my art, this is how I express myself, this is this beautiful process, to suddenly having to face the reality that this is very high pressure work. We're getting insights into the chaos of a mind that must make fantasy art seamlessly result in covetable product that must sell through at all 500 Gucci locations worldwide. Personally, as I'm looking at this collection, I can hear the boss coming into Alessandro's office and saying, you gotta make it personal, Alessandro. You gotta make your art. But also, we need it to click with our clients in Dubai. 
And Gucci ties that back to the ideas of identity that we talked about in the last episode just so fluidly in the Instagram post that they made for the show itself. Presenting the Gucci Fall Winter 18 show space, the concept reflects the work of a designer, the act of cutting, splicing, and reconstructing materials and fabrics to create a new personality. In part two of this video, we'll be addressing the question that I'm sure is on everyone's mind. What were those crazy heads and what was that dragon the one guy was holding? Great questions, you guys are a smart bunch. This show featured a collaboration with a special effects studio that usually works on movies. They've like worked on Ridley Scott stuff. Anyway, they're based out of Rome, Italy. The name of the studio is Machinarium. Alessandro Michele loves these guys. Not only did he use them for this show, but he later on had a replica made of Jared Leto's head for the Met Gala. It takes six months to create one of these replicas. No offense to designers and their schedules, but they are usually not starting on the collection six months in advance. Anyway, super crazy process that they had to go through in order to actually make these heads look so incredibly lifelike. And the same was done for the horns and the eyes and the hands and the forehead. What's interesting is that the inspiration for the heads concept came from a first century sculpture of Togetus Barberini. There's a few debates as to who the sculpture is of and whose heads he's holding, but the one that's most relevant here is that the sculpture is of him and that the heads are his sons. And what's interesting there is that he's not holding the heads that just have necks that just end. He's holding busts, like he's holding sculpted busts. So maybe a meaning that we could pull from that is like, I am a sculptor, but the real art that I make is my sons. So to tie that back to models walking down the runway carrying their own heads, I think maybe tying it back to Haraway and to Foucault, that maybe this is saying that the real art that you make for yourself is the identity that you choose to build. With six months of help from a special effects studio in Rome. The Dragon Baby apparently is a reference to a hoax from 2004 when an author named Alastair Mitchell claimed that he had found a baby dragon preserved in a jar in his garage. Apparently it was to drum up some publicity for a book. Kinda weird, but hey, I'll take it. That dragon is adorable. Finally, I want to talk about something that definitely made headlines when this runway show came out and I think is a necessary thing for us to talk about. The headwear that's featured mostly on white models is a religious item for the Sikh faith. It's called a Dastar. To be sure, a lot of Sikh men do find ways to coordinate it with their outfits so they do look really sharp and purposeful in it, but to put it into the context of a fashion accessory is thought of as disrespectful, understandably. Some initial backlash happened when this collection first hit the runway. Cultural appropriation is something that we thankfully have started actually talking a good deal about in the fashion press, and this was definitely a target of that, so it generated a lot of conversation, most of it very negative. Things got even worse a couple of months ago when this item went to stores. Especially since it wasn't a proper Dastar, it was a, um, a hat that's shaped like a Dastar. Because a distinct part of what makes it a Dastar is that you are actually learning to wrap it around your head and that you're doing this thing yourself. Gucci's was just a hat that you just put on your head and it's just there. There wasn't really anything to wrap, but it did look like it was wrapped, but it wasn't. It was, it was a hat. Obviously, the voices that should be weighed the loudest in discussions like these are those who are actually of the Sikh faith. And the Sikh coalition seemed to kind of summarize these sentiments really well when they said, the turban is not just an accessory to monetize. It's a religious article of faith that millions of Sikhs view as sacred. Many find this cultural appropriation inappropriate since those wearing the turban just for fashion will not appreciate its deep religious significance. Okay. So this is where we're gonna kind of drop all of the, the jokes and all of the light context that I usually have, and we're gonna actually ask a question. If there could be no PR fallout, I think that Gucci would say, if they were being totally honest, that the Destar was put onto white models on purpose because it was part of the overarching theme of being able to build your own identity. Because the Sikh faith is not something that's part of the Western tradition specifically, I think they were guessing that putting one on someone who just looked like a normal white kid would kind of be this image that Haraway talks about of someone forging out and choosing their own identity and figuring out what groups work for them. 
The problem with that, obviously, is that very few people pursue this stuff on that kind of level. I had to dig for a really long time before I came across somebody who actually had these show notes to give them to me so I could tell you that Haraway was a reference for this show. And while I think that the pieces are all there to back up a statement like that, in 2019, on the subject of race relations and religious oppression, you cannot take something that is that nuanced when you know that that picture is going to get isolated and shot around Twitter and the rest of the internet. It's a little bit different for like movies and books and stuff because very few people are going to isolate a part of a movie and claim that the director was trying to push this as an agenda for the entire thing. Most people, when they're watching a movie, they watch the whole movie. But fashion shows get cannibalized all the time. It's actually more common that people cannibalize the show and only see one or two looks than for people to even look at all of the pictures, let alone the video, let alone the show notes. So I don't know. I would really, really love to hear from anyone who is of Sikh faith about this topic. If the context is there, does that make this less offensive to you? Does the context matter when 99% of the people who see the image will never know about the context? All right, let's transition. <sighs> Thank you so much for joining me. This season has been absolutely crazy. 11 weeks ago when we started with the undercover video, there were under a thousand subscribers and now there are over 4,000 of you. So thank you so much for sharing this stuff. Thank you for telling your friends about it. Thank you for forcing your family members to subscribe when they aren't looking. And thanks for all the awesome dialogue. You guys have put me onto some really incredible brands. You guys have shown me some incredible pieces from your own closet that I have come to really love and have posted on my own private mood boards. I have absolutely loved talking to all of you guys, mostly through Instagram, but also through Facebook Messenger and Twitter and everywhere else. We're gonna be back and better than ever with season four. I really cannot wait. I already have a lot of awesome stuff planned and I cannot wait to show you guys. I will see you uh, very, 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 very soon. I love you. Goodbye.